Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life. Manny Pacheco with you late in the afternoon with the authors, this time Mindy Johnson, and she is the expert in uh, animation and women in animation uh, and written a couple of books to prove it. Here at Hollywood Heritage, she's of course uh, showcasing her, wor her work. Mindy, thank you for being here with us. Oh, it's a great joy to be here and always a delight to come celebrate this amazing place. I have to tell you that your presentation was remarkably informative and entertaining. Tell us about some of the, uh, the um, famous women who really were part of animation. There were so many. So many, but we don't know about them until now. We have a couple of places to find more about them, but there's so many remarkable women artists. They were all fine artists in their own right, but went beyond their work in animation. Some of the more notables, um, Mary Blair, of course, many people know her. She's, her artistry is brilliant, stunning, and she really her use of color was the powerhouse secret behind many of the great animated classics out of Disney from the 1950s, Alice in Wonderland, Cinderella, Peter Pan, and more. But we also have women behind the scenes that you may not know about, like Mary Weiser, who started the paint lab at Disney Studios. They were having so many problems with the very limited palette of paints. You would use paints you'd find from the local hardware store to paint your house, and they weren't necessarily blended properly for cell-based animation. Mary said we can do better and went and trained herself in chemistry and established the first and only paint lab in the world making paints exclusively for cell-based animation, transforming the art form. Now you had also mentioned in your uh, speech or your presentation uh, Marge Champion. Yeah, dear Marge, she was a dear friend. Sadly, we've just lost her not too long ago. But what few people realize, we know her, of course, from her great work at MGM and, and beyond as a beautiful dancer with her then husband Gower. But most people don't realize she actually got her start in animation. She was the live action reference model for Snow White, transforming that character into a believable uh, form that we still know and love. But she also did um, the modeling, the reference modeling for the Blue Fairy in Pinocchio, as well as choreographed a few interesting characters in Fantasia. A few elephants and alligators and hippopotamus and ostriches. So. I loved the hippos in Fantasia. They were a personal favorite. Now tell us about your books. You reference these, uh, these pioneers uh, and, and more. What, 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 make, what makes your book so, uh, so readable? Well, we have so many wonderful books about the great men of animation and we love them and their work. But this is the other half. We've all missed out on this half of the animated story. When we look, if we were to look strictly at the men's work, we'd just be seeing pencil sketches, which are great, but they aren't the brilliant, colorful, full-formed characters that we know and love and have fallen in love with for, for decades. And that's really looking past the artistry of what the women have contributed. The illustrations are done by Lorelei Bove. She's one of our leading uh, art directors, visual development artists, and illustrators today at Disney Animation and beyond. And her work is just stunning. She really captures, and in, in addition to capturing the flavor of these remarkable women, Dorothy Ann Blank, who wrote Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, I had to weave in a little bit of magic too, so we've got some inspirational verses here. Um, but it was an opportunity to kind of cast a light on these women who very few people know about. There's our dear Marge Champion and her wonderful contributions to Snow White and more. Wonderful. Look at how colorful and just vibrant your book is. Yeah, it's just delicious. You want to dive into these beautiful pieces. Go back for a second helping. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, and some of the fun, there's Mary Weiser, who developed the paint labs at the studio. I love the comparison to Marie Curie. Yes, well, this wasn't <laughs> Betty Crocker's Kitchen. A lot of people are like, oh, they're recipes. No, these were formulas. This was Madame Curie's lab. She oh. really cultivated an incredible environment where it was all female chemists working on the paints. And they developed solutions for the uh, oh, films. 
Kay Sumner is a great story. She stood six foot three inches tall. And she, they billed her as the giant girl who painted Walt's Seven Little Men. <laughs> they had to build a special desk for her. But while she was working at Disney Studios, she lamented about not getting people to be able to look people in the eye. Because she always had to look down on and trying to find a date. Come on, it's tough enough at average height, trust me. But at six foot three, it was extra challenging. So she wrote an article that appeared in the paper in Los Angeles while she was working at Disney Studios. And within a matter of a couple of days, she had five people standing in her living room who were at the same height. She could finally look them in the eye and she reached out and realized she wasn't alone. So she started what was called the Tip Toppers Club, which was a, then a very big club here in Los Angeles, Absolutely. and they got covered by Life magazine. Soon she was getting calls from people all over the world saying, how do we start our club? We've got to meet more people our own height. So there is still today the International Tall Persons Club started by Kay Sumner, and they give a scholarship in her name every year. I'm six foot four and a half, so I very yes, well know the Tip Toppers <laughs> Club. And, and here's the other fun thing about Kay. With your height, you can imagine, um, you probably, California king beds are due to this woman. Wow. wow. When she started this club, she would have to sleep diagonally on a double bed because that's all the larger beds were. She worked with manufacturers to begin to change our society because we don't all come in the same size. And it's an, you know, an important inspirational story, and I wanted little ones or people of all ages to recognize that you know, that's right. We I come in different shapes and sizes. Your stories are remarkable. You have a great way of telling stories too. Thank you. It's been great fun. Well, now we got Mildred Rossi. She was the artist whose first monster was Chernabog uh, from Night on Bald Mountain, and actually one of the earliest women animators at Disney Studios. After she left Disney, she was also an actress and a model, and found her way to Universal Studios and was the designer behind the creature from the Black Lagoon, as well as the mutants and Wolfman, and designed many of the Universal monsters. But sadly, she got blacklisted. Somebody there wasn't too keen on the attention she was getting, and because she was a woman, they decided we should get rid of her. Sad, but it, important to get her story back in there, and her first monster actually was at Disney. This tiny tome will give you a good upper body workout. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but this little treasure started, we thought it was going to be a charming little book. And uh, very quickly, I realized the avalanche of content that was about coming. And I called my editor and said, this cannot be a small book. And it really covers a hundred years, a century of celluloid history, cinematic history, Hollywood history, women's history, pop culture. Uh, everything is contextualized, so it's kind of a drive-through experience, um, and it gives you the other half of our collected animated stories. Real pictures, um, actual photographs from the Absolutely. Day. Uh, look at that. <laughs> I love that picture. Blanche Sewell, who was MGM Louis B. Mayer's secret weapon, uh, was actually Walt Disney's uh, sister-in-law and helped to kind of encourage him on his storytelling and was even helping to get his Mickey and Minnie creations out there. So I take it from the very beginning Absolutely. of history, yeah, of, of, yeah, of yeah, yeah. film history, because when you think about it, hand colorization on the images is essentially early go. color in animation, going frame by frame. Sure. Let's see what we have here. So oh, there we go. Far beyond Disney and gives you a full century of, of examining where women's roles were very early on in the industry. There we go. Get some. some. Yes, there are a few men in here. <laughs> <laughs> Just a few. <laughs> it's kind of the inverse of what else is out there. Uh, but I wanted to also take a look at the women who had influence on Walt Disney as a young boy. And it turns out he was surrounded by powerful strong, creative women who helped to shape him as a creative filmmaker and storyteller. Uh, even from the very beginning, it was a woman who gave him his start in the industry. Her name was Margaret Winkler, who is responsible largely for where we are with animation today. Oh, this is gonna be good. 
and even going into the earliest Mickey and Minnie's. Um, people forget when Mickey was born, Minnie was too. So, uh, but the evolution of the artistry, going from black and white, three or four shades of gray, into full color artistry. There, you can find Kay Sumner on the page. She's the tallest in the back. <laughs> <laughs> but they wanted to do a little, having fun. There were a lot of great antics and, and events and frivolity. You get a, a few nuts and bolts about the industry. A lot of research. Oh my God. Yeah. And, you know, the sad part was, not much of this was in the Disney archives. A lot of this came from private collections. I literally, me digging under beds and into people's closets and in garages to find artwork and materials. Um, so it's a real deep dive into a world that we've always looked past. So what's really exciting is these volumes as large and perhaps as seemingly small as these are, they're just scratching the surface. There's so many incredible stories to the thousands of women. People thought there were only a handful of women who worked in animation. Turns out there were thousands. Thousands, right. And, and each making incredible contributions. Unfortunately, Walt Disney liked having his name on there and leaving the animators uh, virtually anonymous, even, even the men, so. And that was true of many studios. Um, it was a big deal to make the credits, but it was also very costly. And you can imagine in animation, time was money, and right. it would cost more to have, I mean, think about the great credit rolls we have today, which is terrific. Everyone gets credit, finally but it was a time factor and a cost factor in those days, and even for live action as well. Thankfully now, we can go back and find these right. women and tell their stories and marvel at their artistry. Well, ink and paint, <laughs> the women of Walt Disney's animation, pencils, yeah. pens, and brushes, just two of the great books here by Mindy Johnson as we celebrate Act Two at the afternoon with the author's Hollywood Heritage Edition. I'm Manny Pacheco. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.